and welcome to this machine learning course. My name is Rafik and I'm assistant professor at Halmstad University in Sweden. Okay, let's start with a brief overview of the content of this course. We will start with supervised machine learning, where you will study in detail some linear and nonlinear regression and classification methods. This includes things like logistic regression, k nearest neighbors, support vector machine, random forest, um, artificial neural networks, deep neural networks, and many other methods. You will see how to evaluate their performance, how to achieve a good generalization, and how to use them or apply them in real world use cases. In this setting, we have a machine learning algorithm. This is the learner. And we have a human expert who plays the role of uh, a supervisor or a teacher. And that's why it's called supervised machine learning. We will discuss this in more details later in the course. Then we move to unsupervised machine learning. In this setting, there is no supervision involved. It is purely data driven. Here you will study methods to do data clustering for example, using k-means, Gaussian mixture model, dbscan, hierarchical clustering, and many other methods. You will learn how to do anomaly detection. You will see some dimensionality reduction methods, such as PCA, principal component analysis. And you will learn about the topic of representation learning, for example, using autoencoders. Then you will study some basic notions of reinforcement learning. In this setting, we have an agent who learns to perform some task by continuously interacting with his environment. The agent is at a given state within the environment. He takes an action and he observes the next state and the reward for taking that action. The goal here is for the agent to learn a policy that allows him to select the best action at any given state. In this part, you will study and also put to practice some basic reinforcement learning algorithms such as Q-learning and deep Q networks. You will also study some semi-supervised learning methods. This comes somewhere between supervised and unsupervised learning. Such methods learn using large amounts of unlabeled data and just small amounts of labeled data. So the expert does not spend a lot of uh, effort into labeling. This is useful because in real life, labeling can be costly and time consuming. So it requires a lot of uh, effort from the expert. However, labeled data can usually be obtained at a much lower cost. So it might be useful for you to learn about those uh, semi-supervised methods. For the same reason, you will also study in this course interactive or active learning. In this case, the algorithm interacts with the human expert during the learning process. It formulates a query and learns from the, the feedback provided by the expert. For example, you will study active learning methods for classification that are able to select the most informative data and present it to the human expert for labeling. You will also study interactive anomaly detection methods that learn to detect anomalies that are more relevant to the expert. In addition to this, you will also learn how to use machine learning in the case where the data comes as a stream and becomes available gradually over time. Examples of this include things like video streams and sensors data. So you will study methods to cluster data streams, and to do anomaly detection in time series data. Finally, as you progress through the course, you will get to do practical labs that help you better understand the concepts introduced in the lectures and to apply your knowledge to solve real world problems. Okay, briefly introducing myself. My name is Mohamed Rafik Bougelia, but you can just call me Rafik. I'm assistant professor in machine learning at Halmstad University in Sweden, uh, part of the Department of Intelligent Systems and Digital Design, and also the Center of Applied Intelligent Systems Research. 
I got my PhD in machine learning from the University of Lorraine in France, and before that, my master's degree in computer science from the USTHB University in Algeria. My current research topics include, but they are not limited to, joint human machine learning. This is mainly related to interactive machine learning, and also anomaly and fault detection and predictive ma uh, maintenance of machines like vehicles. Okay, let's go ahead and start this course with a simple introduction about machine learning. So what is machine learning? As one can expect, it's a subfield of artificial intelligence. It is also at the intersection of several other domains like statistics, um, also mathematical optimization. It gives machines the ability to learn and improve from experience. In simple words, instead of programming a machine to perform a task, we instead program it to learn how to perform the task. A more commonly used definition is the following. Suppose that you want to do some task T and you have access to some experience E and some performance measure P. Then you can say that a program is set to learn from experience E with respect to the task T and performance measure P if its performance on the task T as measured by P improves with experience. For example, suppose that you are on Twitter and suppose that Twitter watches which tweets you do or do not mark as uninteresting, not interesting. And based on that, it learns to, to better filter tweets for you. So in this case, what is the task T? Well, classifying tweets as interesting or uninteresting, that's what we want to do, so that's the task. Um, watching you label tweets as interesting or not interesting, well, that's the experience. It involves data. And the fraction of tweets correctly classified as interesting or not, that's the performance measure, how many tweets you correctly classify as interesting or not. So if you are getting better and better at performing this task um, by observing more and more data with more experience, then you, you say that your program is, is learning. Another way to see this is the following. In usual programming, you have some code or some program, and you have your input data. The program processes this data and gives you some output, right? In machine learning, or more specifically in supervised machine learning, you have your input data, and you also provide the expected output corresponding to this data, and this is called the training data set. You provide this to your computer and what you get is a machine learning model. Now, you take this model, you give it a new data and it predicts the output for you. So machine learning algorithms build a model from the training data, then uses this model to make predictions or to take decisions. For example, suppose that our data consists of images and the output consists of labels that can be cat, dog, or lion. So our training data set, which consists of um, the images and their corresponding uh, labels, we give it to a machine learning algorithm and after training it gives us a machine learning model. Now we can use this machine learning model to make predictions. So, given a new image, it will predict that it's probably a dog in this case. Um, it can also um, give the confidence about the prediction. For example, that it is 65% confident that it's a dog. There are a lot of tasks that cannot be solved easily without machine learning. Let's take this example. Suppose that you have a camera on your car and it periodically captures images of the road and sends them to your, to your app. And you want your app to recognize what each image contains. For example, pedestrians, 
bikes, cars, and so on, in order for the car to take the right action at the right time. Is this possible without machine learning? Well, the answer is that it's extremely hard to solve this without machine learning. We cannot define manually all possible rules or all possible general rules um, that allows us to recognize what an image contains. We mentioned earlier different kinds of machine learning, so let's review that quickly here. We have supervised learning, we have something called unsupervised learning, and something called reinforcement learning. Between supervised and unsupervised learning, we have something called semi-supervised learning. And we also have active learning or interactive learning. Within unsupervised learning, we have clustering, anomaly detection, and dimensionality reduction. Within supervised learning, we have something called regression problems, and we have classification problems. We will see the difference between those two later in this video. We mentioned that regression is a supervised machine learning problem. So let's now define what is regression. Suppose that you have data about 11 houses, marked here as dots, where each house is characterized by the size, which is shown here on the x-axis, and it has a price, which is shown on the y-axis. Suppose now that you get a new additional house, which has this size, and you want to know how much you can get for this house, so you want to predict its price. How can a machine learning algorithm help you in this case? One way to do that is to fit a straight line to the training data that you have, those 11 houses. And based on this line, you will predict the price for the new house that you got. And the predicted price based on this linear model will be 150. Or instead of fitting a straight line to your training data, you can decide that maybe it's better to fit a slightly more complex function, like for example, a polynomial of degree two. And then you can use it to predict the price for this new house which would be slightly different from the one that you predict using the linear model. How to decide which of those two models is the best for this data set? We will see that later in the course when we talk about model selection and hyperparameter tuning. What you need to know for now is that this is an example of a regression problem. Why is it regression? It's because what we want to predict is the price this is our output, and the price is continuous value. It consists of values between 0 and 400 in this case. It's not classes or categories, but continuous values. And regression problems are examples of supervised learning problems. Why is it supervised? Well, it's because the right answer, here the price, is part of our training set. So for each data point in our training set, or for each house in our training set, we know the corresponding price. And those prices have been given by a human expert. So basically it's a supervised learning problem. Here are some more examples of regression problems. In this first example, we want to predict the power consumption of some heating system. And this depends on the outside temperature. So the colder it is outside, the more power we need, um, we need to consume. Suppose that we want to fit a linear regression model to this training data, so we get this linear model. And next time you can use this model to make predictions. For example, if you know that tomorrow it will be minus five degrees outside, so you can use this model to predict what is the power um, that the machine will consume by tomorrow. In this second example, what we want to predict is the price, the price of some houses. Uh, so that's the output. And we want to do that based on two features. The first one is the size of the house and the second one is the number of rooms. So what you get here is um, a linear model we want to fit, again, a linear model to, to our training data. 
but it's not a straight line, it's a hyperplane because we have more than, than one feature. In this third example, what we want to predict is the number of cups of coffee sold and this depends on the time of the day. So that's our feature. Um, and suppose that we want to, to fit a nonlinear model this time. So you get um, some model like this one. And you can use this model to make predictions. For example, if you know that it's 8 o'clock in the morning, then you can predict that the number of cups of coffee that will be sold is this amount. We also said earlier that classification is a supervised learning problem too. So let's now define what is classification. Let's take the following example where we want to predict if a patient has a malignant breast cancer, and that's denoted by 1, or has a benign breast cancer, and that's denoted by 0. So that's our output. And we want to do that based on one feature, which is the tumor size. So these data points represent our patients having a malignant cancer, and these data points here represent our patients having a benign cancer. And please note that here what we want to predict, our output, consists of classes, two classes in this example. These are discrete output values. They can take, or the output can take, either the value 0 or 1. So we can actually visualize the classes with different colors or shapes. And it's usually easier to visualize using that because if we do that, we don't need the, this, this axis which indicates the output. We can just have one axis, which is our feature, and then the classes are represented by different colors or shapes. Usually the patients are characterized by more than one feature. So in this example, we show two features, the tumor size, and also the age, which is the second feature. And the classes here are represented by different shapes and colors. Now suppose that we have all this training data, meaning all those patients uh, or data points labeled as either 1 or 0. And we have a new patient, which is not part of our training data. And this patient is characterized by a tumor size S, and an age A. And what we want to do is to predict if this patient has a malignant or benign breast cancer. So how can uh, a machine learning algorithm help us in this case? One thing you can do is to fit a straight line to this training data so that the two classes are well separated. So you get this linear model or linear classifier. And then you can use this model and predict that the new patient belongs to class 0 because it lies in this region, in this half space, or this region of the feature space. So it's a benign cancer, class 0. Another thing you can do is to decide that maybe you don't need or you don't want this linear model and you want a slightly more complex model, like for example this nonlinear model here, because maybe it separates better the two classes in our training set. And then you can use this model to make also predictions about new patients. We will see later in the course how to select the best model. What you need to know for now is that this is again an example of supervised machine learning problem. Why is it supervised? It's because our training set contains the right answers or the right labels, the true labels. So for each patient in our training set, we know if it is labeled as having a malignant or a benign cancer. And this is also a classification problem. It's not a regression problem. And this is because the output consists of classes. In this case, um, the target variable or the output can take only two values, zero or one, malignant or benign. So it's only categories. As a side note, in this example, we used only two features, but we will see later in the course machine learning algorithms that can easily deal with much larger number of features. So classification is all about learning decision boundaries.
The boundary is defined by the classification model, which can be nonlinear, as in this case, or it can be a linear classification model, as in this case. Here, as we have only two features, our linear classifier is just a straight line. And here, as we have more than three features, or more than two features, um, our linear classifier is a hyperplane. So both classification and regression are examples of supervised machine learning. The difference is that in regression, the output, or what you want to predict, the target variable, consists of real values. These are discrete values. For example, you want to predict the price of houses, the power consumption. Um, you want to predict some index, which belongs to the interval 0 to 1 that indicates how much a patient is healthy or something like this. But for classification, the output consists of discrete values. Uh, these are classes or categories, and usually they have no order between them, class A, B, C, D. For example, you want to predict um, if an image contains a car, a bike, uh, a truck, or pedestrian, and so on. Here are some examples of problems. Please pause the video and try to determine for each of them if it's a classification or a regression problem. Okay, for the first one, Amazon wants to predict how many articles will be sold over the next two months. In this case, what we want to predict is the number of articles that will be sold. This output doesn't constitute classes, so it's a regression problem. Here, time constitutes one of the features. In the second problem, Volvo wants to detect whether the air pressure system of some vehicle, for example a bus, is faulty or healthy. And this is done based on uh, data collected from similar vehicles that we know if they are uh, faulty or healthy. So this is, uh, this is based on some training data. In this case, what we want to predict is uh, whether the system is faulty or healthy. So these are two classes. So it's a classification problem. For the third problem, you want, for example, to detect um, the price of some cryptocurrency, uh, how much it will be by tomorrow. And you want to do this based on some features, for example, the historical prices, um, as well as some other features like the news or the user sentiments, if it affects the price and so on. So what we want to predict here is the price of the cryptocurrency. And these are continuous values, so it's a regression problem. In the fourth problem, suppose that you have collected um, a large set of research articles from the internet, and you don't know um, what's the topic of each of those articles. You don't have their labels, right? So what you want to do is to group them into groups of articles that talks about the same topics. So you want to group them into groups, and within each group, you will have articles that talks about similar topics. So this is clearly not a regression problem, but it's not a classification problem either, because this is a set of unlabeled research articles. We don't know what each article is talking about, so the labels, the true labels, are not part of our training data. So that's actually not a supervised learning problem, but it's an unsupervised learning problem. More specifically, this is a clustering problem. We will talk more about this next in this video. Let's now talk a little bit about unsupervised machine learning and more specifically about clustering. Previously in supervised learning, for example, for classification, we had some labeled training examples. So if this is our data set, for each input x, we have the corresponding label y. 
For example, if we take this data point xi from the training data, then we know that it belongs to this first class. It has this first label here. And based on this labeled training data set, we can learn classification model that can separate those two classes in a good way. Note that in this example, each each point xi belongs to R2 because we have actually two features. In unsupervised learning, for example, in a clustering problem, we have an unlabeled set uh, of data. For example, if this is our data set, then we only have the input data points without their corresponding labels. And what we try to do in this case is to find a set of clusters um, or groups such that the data points within each group are similar and the data points within different groups are different or dissimilar. Note that those clusters are not known beforehand. We try to discover them purely from the unsupervised, um, unlabeled data. Some applications of this includes news articles clustering. So if you go to Google News, um, it does exactly this. It automatically groups together uh, stories or news articles on the web that talk about the same topic. And this is done without labels. It's, it's just done based on the text of each article. Other applications of clustering includes um, grouping people based on their genes. So if you have a set of genes um, that describes a set of individuals, so each person is described by, by those genes, and the different colors here indicates how much individuals uh, do or do not have a certain gene. And so by taking those individuals, you can group them into different clusters based on their genes. Um, so for each cluster, you will get a set of peoples um, that have similar genes that are of the same type, basically. Another example includes social network uh, analysis, uh, where you want to group people um, based on profiles from social media, for example, people that share similar interests or people that usually talk to each other and so on. 